I'm a father of a beautiful young boy who's turning four years old this year. I'm certain that since the break of dawn, parents have looked at their children wondering what will become of them and what they'll do with their lives, always in the context of the world that they're growing up in and how they could imagine the future will be. When I'm looking at my boy today, I honestly cannot imagine the world that he will be growing up in. Just the other day, I asked his mom if he's ever gonna take a driver's license. And of course she looked at me like I was a complete idiot. But then we started talking about it and it made more and more sense that no, we actually don't think that he'll ever have to take a driver's license, at least not in the way that we used to. And then our thoughts turned towards the school that he'll attend in just a few years. And that really scared us to the bone. With so much of the new world being digitized, augmented and replaced by technology, the question is, why is the educational system that my boy will meet in just a few years still basically the same as it was hundreds of years ago when the British were still an empire? <laughs> <laughs> we are educating our children into a world that no longer exists. It's simply not relevant anymore. Merely changing the content of the education is not enough. For the sake of our children, we need to rethink the whole system from the bottom up. And technology is allowing us some amazing ways of doing this. Now, the world and technology has always been evolving at a faster and faster pace until a point where we no longer perceive the massive impact that a technology has on our lives. Take the planes that some of us flew in on. Any given day in the skies over London, several thousand planes will be in the air. But we don't perceive it. And aerospace technology has evolved massively over the past 100 years, even to a point where some of these uh, airlines are actually pretty decent today, right? <laughs> Now, look at the phone in your pocket. It's only nine years ago that Steve Jobs presented the first iPhone and had to teach to the world how to use a touchscreen. The rate of change and mass adoption of globally impacting technologies is growing exponentially. Yet, when we think about innovation and this elusive next big thing, we tend to think linearly. There's this anecdote in innovation that while a global market leading company like yours will be building a fort and sending out ships to search for this next big thing, you have startups building amazing stuff around you that we might not even have a word for yet. And you thought that building up a fort would protect you against all of this outside of your uh, global company. And you think that the road from A to B is linear, but it's not. It never was. It's only the rate of change that's been increasing ever so slowly that it's created this illusion of linear change. But because of having this focus on your linear growth and thinking that this will protect your business, you're focusing so much on the incremental growth, incremental development, incremental innovation. You've heard innovation so much that it's practically lost all meaning to you guys. But because you are focusing so much on this incremental innovation, you have absolutely no idea about what is incoming because everything below that line of your incremental innovation is hidden in obscurity. And whatever is going on inside this hackerspace, homebrew realm of infinite awesomeness might not even make sense to you guys. And the people working down here are fueled by a passion to build and change the world. And down here, passion comes before the paycheck. And passion will always win. Take an example of Jurex. Do you think that they would be thinking about microfluidics, Bluetooth, or on-demand neutering when they think about innovating safe sex? These companies are, these startups are. Hoop is a small ring that uses a cartridge filled with microfluidic logic and sensors to make blood analysis as easy as putting on a ring. 
are curacents that use the regular discharge of blood and mucosal fluids to create the most non-invasive blood analysis for women ever, and it'll send the data directly to your phone. Or take the BiMEC that will neuter a man with the click of a button and re-engage fertility on demand. Think about genetics. Back in the early 90s, the Human Genome Project was launched with the goal of mapping the entire human genome, the double helix that is DNA. Given $6 billion and 15 years to do so, after seven years in 97, only 1% of the genome had been mapped. And every single expert in the world proclaimed the project a massive failure. Because after all, 1% after seven years meant that it would take 700 years to map the entire genome, right? Well, four years later, the project finished under budget and about 696 years earlier than any expert had, had um, imagined because the process was based on what's known as exponential technologies. And today we're seeing great companies using this technology on a day-to-day -day basis. With 23andMe, you can have your own entire genome mapped in a matter of 14 days, and it'll cost you around 170 euros, or 30 million times less than 15 years ago. But that's including shipping. Athgene will provide you with a personalized training program based on your genes. You still have to do the workout, but now at least you'll know exactly what exercises will be the best match for your genes. Now think about sensors that are becoming smaller, faster, cheaper, and better all the time, making it feasible to implement them into more and more things around us. Or think about 3D printing that in the matter of 12 years looks very much like the technology that will tumble over the shipping industry. After all, if I can print it here, why on earth would I want to ship it from there? It's no coincidence that UPS are rolling out 3D printers at all their store locations. And by the way, mask profit dropped 80% last year. Maybe it's about time that their R&D starts researching filament recycling or something other than that next big super tanker. And while on that subject, do you believe that the new Panama Canal being dug out right now will be paid back depth three in 30 years? Talk about linear planning and projections, huh? So how do we fit all of this into the DNA of our startup in a way that is completely aligned with development in exponential technologies? Um, let me start out by telling you what it is that we're actually doing. Quite simply, it's the world's smartest building blocks. Now, I'm from Denmark, so you can trust me, we know a thing or two about building blocks, right? <laughs> You see, we figured out that nature has already provided us with the best kind of tutor, mentor, and teacher that our kids can have, and it's called play. Yet we're so busy educating our children that they completely forget how to play, and they forget how to learn. Frankly, schools are killing creative geniuses on a day-to-day -day basis around the world, and that is what scares the living daylight out of my girlfriend and I. Do we really want to rob our own son of his amazing open creative mind? Absolutely not. Do we want to empower him to become the best possible him that he can be? Absolutely yes. Does the educational system in its current form facilitate this? Mm, not so much. Now I get the problem. I mean, quantifying play is really, really hard. Getting an A in hula hoop or a B in tag doesn't really fit into any standardized tests, does it? For the most part, the problem is not about the teachers. These people are working with a fierce passion and will to do better for our children. The problem is the system itself, from your kindergarten to your diploma. Massive open online courses are democratizing and leveraging the access to online learning on a world-leading uh, level, using huge amounts of data and analytics about how the, uh, the pupils interact with the system, MOOCs are amazingly good at educating 
higher learning. But three-year-old kids will not log into Coursera or edX or Khan Academy. My boy can't reap the benefit of massive open online courses, yet it's in these formative years of his young child brain that the foundation for everything else is built. Why can't we create a MOOC for children? Simply because there is no way to capture enough data about their development other than having them click along on a screen or a computer all day long, which isn't that good either, is it? The, all the assessment of a child's um, developmental stage in the early years of the child life are based on the subjective um, opinion of a few individuals around the child. There's no way to quantifiably assess the real cognitive state of every single child in a real-time environment whatsoever. None. Why on earth are we letting our youngest kids being left behind from the benefits and the possibilities of technology today? We're not anymore. We are embedding each single building block with motion sensors, physical and wireless connectivity, lights, and enough battery life to last a whole playing day. This allows children to build and play in the real world with their hands and with their fingers while interacting with the digital world and the kids around them, not sucked into the screen, but actually interacting. And on a side note, every single interaction is being recorded, everything from um, the outcome of a, of a challenge, the gender, the age of the child, the time of day, the general location. And I know what you're thinking, like, whoa, whoa why would I want to record all of this data about my child? Because this creates the platform that will finally be able to show you a clear picture about your child's natural competencies, skills, and abilities. And it will provide you with um, uh, intelligent suggestions for games, activities, and challenges that you can do with your child away from the screen, in the real world, with real people that are based on your child's natural competencies, with the data that is created purely through play, not through testing, not through exams. When a child plays and builds with their hands. They are creating new worlds. They are exploring adventures. They are creating a complex storyline. And most of all, they're having tons of fun. Try stopping a child from playing. Play is such an essential part of a child's early development, yet it fits so poorly into the current state of the educational system. And when children can't sit still, and when children can't follow education, they're slammed with what diagnosis? Attention deficit disorder? Come on, is it the child or the system that's failing here? We're bringing big data into play. And it turns out that play is not only relevant for children. We are working on pilot projects with patients suffering from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, recovering from stroke, cerebral palsy, autism, everywhere where there's an interest in extracting information about play and about cognitive development. We're not a toy company. We're a life science company. What we are creating is the world's first global database about how different generations play. And then we look through that data and we try to understand what goes on. And maybe, just maybe, we might be able to learn something about how the brain develops and apply that to a brain that is degenerating and quite possibly prolong the time that a, pa a patient will have with a higher quality of life purely through playing. And that's why we're on a mission to help the world embrace play. We didn't start out this way, but by constantly asking ourselves, what business are we really in? Slowly, we were able to merge a creative idea into one of the highest growth potential companies coming out of Denmark in recent years. And by the way, two years ago, when we first created this concept, it was absolutely bonkers to think that you could put this much technology into every single building block and sell it for $200. A year ago, we could buy the basic components off the shelf 
and have our first prototypes functioning right out of the box without having developed any hardware ourselves. Today, we are working with world-leading uh, sensor and chip manufacturers on making Play Dexter a reality. So today, it's almost doable. Tomorrow, it's going to be feasible, and the day after, it's going to be obvious because we are relying on exponential technologies. And because we are designing our company around exponential technologies and the developments in these technologies, we are able to move around different obstacles that other companies might hit. The best thing that can happen for us is when people start to 3D print their own cubes. Sensors, batteries, lights and all. That might sound bonkers, but that's the development that we're seeing in all of these different exponential technologies. At no point are we relying on any profit from the sales of our hardware, because hardware is already dead. So when people can start 3D printing, we're looking at zero sales, zero manufacturing, zero shipping, and zero friction, adding more people to our platform, essentially turning a hardware company into a complete software company. We're right at the cusp between why on earth would you and why on earth wouldn't you? And that's really the hallmark of a truly innovative product when you're starting to move the perception of what is normal in the market. <laughs> to get there, you have to experiment, to try and build and fail and learn and experiment and fail some more. Because we are working below the line of incremental innovation, because we are working in obscurity, we are working with massive unknowns and we need to experiment to learn and to find out what is gonna be this next big thing. But you guys don't like risk, right? Because risk means less predictable incremental growth. And that's not pretty good if you're going to go to your manager and say, sorry, fuck up. <laughs> but you have to understand that just 10 startups working out there on something that from your perspective might be completely, you know, we don't get it, will eventually, quite possibly, turn into that next big thing. And these startups are on a rule today that they're generally 10 times faster they're 10 times cheaper, and they're 10 times more profitable than you are. Making it really, really hard for you to do much else than to just sue them. Uh, really, in this day and age of open innovation, that is not okay. You got to ask yourself, what business are we really in? Are you selling shampoo or smooth hair, shavers or smooth skin, chips or fat bellies, perfume or attraction? These are not just questions to ask in marketing, but across the whole organization, in business development, customer development, product development, and most of all in the boardroom, because that is where the real change needs to happen across the whole organization. These new kinds of startups are called an exponential organization. And the good news is that you can become one too. Thank you. <laughs>